Hello, everyone. I'm Mark McCarthy here uh, from, from Genentech in California. I welcome you to the, the final plenary of this uh, great uh, meeting, um, which is entitled M2M2M, which is a bit cryptic, but it, uh, the emphasis is definitely here on the final M. We've heard a lot about the maps and mechanisms M's in previous sessions, but it's really in the final M, medicines, where the rubber hits the road in terms of our desire to use all of this uh, information we're generating to guide us to uh, new, uh, safe and effective medicines. Not, of course, that the first two are not relevant to that endeavor. Um, they're, of course, fundamental, and pharma and biotech have invested heavily in these areas, most obviously through a number of pre-competitive consortia that you'll all be familiar with. But as we move to think about specific targets and specific disease processes and working out which of these has the best prospects of delivering safe and effective medicines to uh, address unmet clinical need. We do start to move out of a world where uh, agnostic approaches that can be deployed across the genome and across disease processes uh, have sway to, to more bespoke approaches that are inherently more difficult to scale. So you know, these are some of the challenges that Pharma Council and the Medicines Working Group within ICDA have been deliberating over. Um, thanks to the uh, organizers for giving us the opportunity to contribute to the, the planning of this meeting. And we're very happy to nominate these three great speakers who will speak to some of those challenges and opportunities as we move into the use of uh, maps and mechanisms uh, to uh, arrive at um, medicines. So we'll start off with uh, Anne uh, Carpenter, uh, who will be well known uh, to many of you. She's an institute scientist at the Broad. Uh, Institute of Harvard and MIT, and she's going to speak to us about finding disease phenotypes using images. And over to you. Great, thanks. Thank you so much. I'm really glad to be here live today um, to tell you about some of the research that we're doing focusing at the image end of the spectrum, um, using images as a way to detect disease phenotypes and candidate therapeutics. And as was just said, in, in a really um, systematic kind of way that can be relevant across diseases. So I really hope that you'll, um, that everyone listening today will have something they can glean from this um, talk and something that's even actionable. So let's get started. I wanna give a little bit of context into the environment that we are working in, where we often are testing lots and lots of samples to extract features from images. And throughout the talk, you'll see why we do this. But fundamentally, um, you've already heard from David Van Vallen, who is active in this field as well, in the, in the process of extracting good information out of images. So when we have robotic microscopes working around the clock, we end up with thousands to millions of images and we need to get useful information out of them, whether it's using deep learning or classical techniques, somehow we need to extract juicy bits of information out of images and that leaves us with lots of metrics that we can quantify to try to identify disease phenotypes. Now, historically, when you say, I wanna use images to look at disease phenotypes, um, typically that means a researcher comes in with a thought in mind of exactly what they would like to study. So as, was, as we've heard in the prior panel, if you're studying um, fat distribution and um, adipocyte regulation, you wanna use adipocytes and you wanna, measure, you wanna label the lipids. If you're studying neurons, you wanna uh, label the synapses, you might wanna measure branch points and so on. So usually it's the case when people are using images for disease phenotyping, you know in advance what you want to measure, and so you develop your model system and pick your stains appropriately. We're not going to talk about that today. I think it's amazing and very cool way of interrogating different biological systems, but I want to push us in a, in a different direction for our talk today. I think in this world of high content screening or image-based screening or image-based disease phenotyping, um, it's I think you all get the concept. You, you make a cell model, you pick some stains, and you decide what you want to measure. And I would say for the most part, thanks to pioneering work by many, including David Van Vallen that we just heard from, it's now pretty possible. If you can see some phenotype by eye that you're interested in, it's almost always going to be quantifiable. So that's not to say it's a solved problem, but it is relatively solvable with, without too much effort these days. Um, so that's why I want to turn to this other direction, which is using images in a different kind of way. And it might, it might blow your mind a little if you haven't heard about this kind of thing before. We call it image-based profiling. And this is where we characterize image-based samples based on all of the features are there rather than just the ones that we think we're interested in as biologists. So what do I mean by this? If we 
the concept is measure everything and then ask questions later. So we have the images and we extract all the features we can from the single cell data that is naturally there in these images. And this gives us a data matrix that looks very much like single cell RNA-seq, uh, transcriptomic kind of data. Um, it could also look like human phenotypic data if we have humans and uh, phenotypes uh, across the axes. So once you have this sort of data, then of course, uh, as biologists, we're all comfortable with the idea of we have a high dimensional readout from our biological samples. Let's cluster them and see who looks like whom, which ones are different from each other, what's the impact of a variant on how a sample responds. So this is a basic concept that we're using in, in any profiling. And in image-based profiling, we tend to use this assay called cell painting. There's nothing magical about it. It's a very cheap, inexpensive, um, easy, robust kind of assay where we just throw these different dyes onto the cells. They label the major compartments, the major organelles of the cell. So cell biologists will be very happy with what is labeled here because they're all just very general. They tell us some general properties about the cell. That might make you think, well, how on earth are we going to um, cluster anything with specificity for a particular disease area? And I'll, I'll show you some, some evidence of that. But what can we do once we have these features extracted? I'll, of course, He's giving the rest of the talk is going to tell you some specific examples, but just to get you thinking, when you extract signatures from a cell's image under certain conditions, then you can match those profiles in order to match, for example, drugs to genes or genes to diseases or diseases to drugs and so on. So we'll show some examples of that. Uh, one, for example, taking a drug um, and matching it to CRISPR knockouts in order to figure out the drug's target or identifying a signature in a disease patient cell line and then screening drugs to revert it. All right, so let's look like some examples of how this concept of image-based profiling could be helpful along the entire drug discovery pipeline. So first, um, this is kind of how, how things end up um, getting into the, into the market and useful to patients. Often it begins with an assay. Sometimes that's a heavily customized, very, um, very unique assay that has been designed for a particular disease area. But what we'll talk about today is, is there maybe a more systematic way that we create assays when we don't exactly know what's the correct cell type or what's the thing that we wanna stain for. So let's look at an example of here. We've been working with Miko Taipale at the University of Toronto, and Jessica Lacoste and his group has worked very hard to tag a lot of um, human proteins. And he, she specifically does so in pairs, the reference version of the protein, as well as a version that's been associated with a human disorder. And when many times when she does this, she sees absolutely no difference. The protein's localization does not change at all, but occasionally when you have a, a pathogenic variant, you see a change such as is shown here. And so what's exciting when that happens is that it immediately, you know, first of all, you don't need to know anything about this protein. What does it do? What cell type are we supposed to be studying it in? Anything else? If you see a phenotype, it tells you that this protein's function um, or it's, it, this protein structure or function, something about it is changed because of the presence of this variant. And when that is true, you don't have to necessarily know more about its mechanism. You can just immediately start testing drugs to try to reverse the phenotype. And if you wanted to, you could also test genetic perturbations in order to find potential targets or pathways that would modulate the change of this behavior that we see. And so again, doesn't work for every disorder, doesn't work for every variant, but the fact that it can be done extremely systematically allowed them to test thousands of disease variants um, together with their reference counterparts and then identify changes, not just in the protein localization, but they actually had a couple of other fluorescent channels in, the, in this um, experiment, kind of like the cell painting concept, a couple of other channels are there to look at the changes in their morphology. And altogether, we've discovered about 200 disease phenotypes in this, in this one experiment so far. Um, what's exciting about that is that we can then um, take each of these and test for existing drugs to reverse the phenotype. And we're working on a pooled barcode based uh, image optical profiling technique so that we can combine the 200 diseases all together and test drugs systematically rather than doing 200 separate drug screens. It's good that we're trying to figure that out now because um, coming down the road here over the next four to five years, we're um, working with a consortium that's just launched to test 80,000 Mendelian variants in this similar kind of um, assay, as well as in a yeast protein protein interaction assay. So through those two routes, we hope to identify many more um, functional impacts of variants that are associated with human disorders.
So there are many ways to identify disease phenotypes by image-based profiling. We've just talked about one of them where you tag the protein and look at its localization, or you look at the morphological impact on the other channels, which are not shown here. Other ways of approaching this um, that we've tried include taking patient cell lines where you have cells grown from patients that have a disorder and, and are nicely matched to those that do not have the disorder, and then look to see, are there any single cell differences in the morphology of those cells? And for example, we found such a thing in bipolar disorder and are pursuing looking for drugs that can reverse the morphological changes that we see that are associated with that disorder, which happen to be in involved with the mitochondria localization. And then a third approach um, is to over or under express genes that have been associated with disorders. And that's an approach taken by originally the University of Utah and then a spin-off company called Recursion, which um, now has hundreds of disease models that are available for screening and is based on this concept of let's knock down the gene that is known is a known loss of function for a given disorder and just look and see, does, is the cell impacted in any way? And they use the, the cell painting assay for that as well. So those are some of the different ways to try to make new disease phenotyped uh, assays. And the next question might be, um, okay, I've, I've performed a genome-wide uh, sequencing study and a genome scale um, genome sequencing study with uh, lots of patient samples. And you now have a list of variants and it might be hundreds of variants, of course. And um, now what do you do? So you can pick them one by one and, and devote a, a career to studying each of the individual genes and the variants that are in that gene, or you can try something a bit more systematic. Again, it won't work all the time, but um, for many cases, um, it's a really quick first pass uh, strategy. So in this um, example, we um, profile genes and or alleles and, um, and look to see how does it compare with known genes or alleles that have already been, uh, been studied. So here's an example, lumping them all together. Uh, in our initial attempt at this, we overexpressed about 200 genes in a diverse set of pathways. We did the, the cell painting image-based assay. We did the image analysis to extract features, and then we clustered the profiles based on their similarity. So this is just a circular dendrogram showing the similarity, and hopefully you can see that um, different known biological pathways uh, cluster together. And as a cell biologist myself, this was so gratifying to see that many of these relationships took painstaking decades of work to try to work out. And this one image-based assay is telling us um, about the similarities between genes that are, that are together in some similar pathways. So you've got um, BRAF and, and KRAS are up here. You've got the HIPPO pathway down here, um, NF-kappa-B as well, clusters. And so it's just really lovely to see that the, the, the morphology of the cells is telling you how, it's, how the cells have been perturbed. So this is pretty exciting, especially the, the fact it's true that this um, set of genes was sort of cherry picked as a bunch of people's favorite genes. So it's not the same as a random set of genes. Nevertheless, 50% of these yielded a phenotypic signature that we could distinguish from negative controls in a single cell type at a single time point. So you can imagine if we test a few more cell types and a few more different kinds of stains, not just the original ones in cell painting, we could increase the, the proportion of, of genes that can be interrogated by a simple image-based assay. So we're scaling this up to the uh, uh, larger chunk of the genome. And um, what the other direction that we're going besides testing all the genes is to attempt to look at different alleles. So here's just one little zoom in on a, um, on a, a paper that I think is in bioarchive. I should have updated this slide um, by this lead author, uh, Juan Caicedo. And we here are overexpressing actually not just BRAF alleles, but a, a lot of alleles that are associated with lung adenocarcinoma. And I'm just zooming in on this one gene to make it a little easier to see. But the concept is the same as what I showed before, except instead of looking at wild type genes and who clusters with whom, here we can look at how the variants cluster. And so for BRAF specifically, um, the wild type version overexpressing it doesn't seem to do much in this cell type at this time point. And we know this because it, it clusters with some of the negative controls down here. So the wild type doesn't do much, but then when you have all these different variants, you see different behavior. So this is a correlation matrix so that um, big blobs here mean the samples look like each other. And you can see that most of the variants look alike. And these are all the constitutively active variants, whereas this cluster of three up here are known to be not constitutively active mutations. And so you know, this could be any gene that gives a positive result in the assay. It could be any gene 
and any size collection of variants. And if this is how your result looks, you can say, well, I, I could pick three variants at random and study them. But if I've got limited resources, maybe I'll pick one from this set and one from this set and one of these guys down here. And so we, we see this as a method for allowing people to quickly triage long lists of variants and try to figure out the structure among them, which ones are, are having the same kind of impact on protein function without having to develop a customized assay for that protein's function. So you don't have to know the function and you don't have to make an assay for the function. You can just um, test it in this rather generic kind of image-based assay. Here's a little zoom in on how this looks at the single cell level. So here's a variant, a particular variant in a particular gene that doesn't have much impact on its function. And you can tell that because the control, um, the control cells are here. The wild type, overexpressing the wild type version of the protein does a thing to the cells. It makes a lot of them look very different from controls. But then when you make the mutation, there's not much, um, there's not much impact on the morphology. And you can see that by contrast in, with this particular mutation in EGFR, we see a very different story, which is that normally the wild type is somewhat co-localized with the control samples, um, but, but some islands of different difference. And then when the mutation is present, certainly the, the, um, the cells look dramatically different. And so here it's pretty clear that this mutation has an impact on the function of this, um, of this gene. Now, um, the exciting thing is, well, let's, how can we, how can we move this forward and, and identify some chemical regulators of particular gene or disease profiles? So if you take any of the methods that I've described so far and identify a phenotype that's associated with either a disorder or overexpressing a gene that has been associated with your disease or expressing a variant of the gene that is associated with the disease, if you have a phenotype, you can then try to find compounds that, um, that um, produce the same, same or opposite impact on cells. And you can do that by physically testing the compounds, which I've just um, mentioned already. Of course, you can, you can take cells that are in the disease-like state and add compounds systematically, but it takes time and money to do that. You can also do a virtual query. So that's what I'm going to talk about here, where we take that gene or disease profile and we just look up in a library of chemical perturbations. Have we ever seen cells look like this before? Um, or have we ever seen cells that look the opposite of this phenotype before? And so here's the concept. You, you put in a gene. We tested this recently with 69 genes that we overexpressed, and each of them gave some kind of distinctive signature. And so that's the input of our query. And then we have a library of around 15,000 compounds that also give a, 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 a signature we rank order them based on similarity. So at the top of the list, we get compounds that match the signature. At the very bottom of the list, we get um, compounds that oppose the signature. So they're anti-correlated with the signature. Either way, we take those tops and bottoms of the list and we test them to see if they are actually drugs that impact that gene's function. And so we tested this on known gene compound pairs where we have a gene and we know that the particular compound targets it. And we found 12 genes out of the 63 that were tested um, that had a known compound um, gave nine, what was 19% uh, was the, the rate of getting the correct answer out of this data set that was with known gene compound pairs. And so then we, we um, tested it to find actual new drugs. And we found, um, I won't go through any detail, but just say for the seven genes that we tested, for three of them, we found compounds that, that uh, had the behavior that we were looking for in downstream assays by experts who know something about each individual gene's function. So it's pretty exciting that this virtual querying might be effective. Because of this, we are uh, ramping up this um, consortium, which is going to be releasing data in November publicly. And it's a beautiful data set with lots of small molecules to match against, as well as some CRISPR knockdowns and overexpression to also allow this kind of matching. Um, I want to point you to, if you want to jot down or take a screenshot of um, the slides, you're welcome to grab a PDF of these slides and look up um, the different um, references and other kinds of ways that image-based profiling can be useful. But I hope you found this interesting. And with that, I will conclude. Thanks. Thank you, Anne. That was, uh, that was great. Um, I've got a very noisy dog in the background, as you uh, may have heard. Um, I've, it's probably time for one question. There's one posted, and there's the question I was going to ask uh, as well, which is, you know, how cell type dependent is this? We spend an awful lot of time worrying about appropriate cell models. And so we'd love to get your view of uh, how generic we can you know, get away with being, if I can put it like that. Yeah, I would say this method, this approach that I've described today, like a lot of things, is one of those that is, it's 
inexpensive and it's systematic and cheap to do. So like, why not give it a try first before you go deeper? So I would say if, if you're obsessively focused on a one particular disorder, then of course, make the most beautiful cell model, the most realistic and physiological cell model that you can, um, as long as it's compatible with the things you want to do, which is um, testing thousands of drugs or testing hundreds of variants. Um, but if that's not possible in your ideal model, why not give it a try in something that's maybe a little simpler? And um, that might be a cultured cell line that is nevertheless closer to your biology of interest. Um, but you might just give it a try in, in the line we usually use, which is UTOS, because it's big and flat and, um, and, um, and so on. OK. Terrific. Um, I'm sure there are probably some other questions that you can follow up later, but I think you need to move on. Thanks very much for that. Uh, our second speaker is Melissa Miller, who's in the Internal Medicine Research Unit at, at Pfizer, uh, where she's Director of Human uh, Genetics in that group. And uh, Melissa is going to talk to us about uh, human genetic structure activity relationships. Over to you, Melissa. Good morning, everybody. Uh, thank you to the ICDA organizers for putting together what is a really great talk. Uh, and thank you also for giving me the opportunity to present our work. Um, as Mark mentioned, we're gonna talk about something today called human genetic structure activity relationship. Um, and for brevity's sake, I will refer to this as HGSAR going forward. This is a method that we've been working on at Pfizer for the last couple of years to be able to link genetic association data to high throughput functional data to be able to validate and identify new targets. So I sit in a research unit at Pfizer, which is responsible for early drug discovery across a number of diseases. And so we spend a lot of time thinking about how we apply human genetics to um, these kinds of efforts. And one of the things that we're really interested in is how we productionize the application of human genetics into drug discovery. If we think about target selection and target prioritization, this involves addressing three key questions. And I think that's a little bit of an oversimplification. We are often thinking about more than three key questions, uh, but I think for sure these three questions are always or almost always relevant. So uh, say I have a genetic hit for a disease or a phenotype that I'm interested in. The first question, uh, is the SNP to gene question. So which gene is being influenced by the genetic variant or variants that I have identified? Uh, the second question is, does the genetics tell us anything about the directionality uh, for this particular gene on this particular disease? Would we need an activator, an inhibitor, an agonist, or an antagonist? And the last question is the one of horsepower. Uh, so if I were to, does the genetics tell us anything about this? If I were to target this particular gene for this disease, would we have a meaningful impact on disease? Um, so I'm, I'm talking to a room full of people who have done genetics for quite some time now. So I don't have to tell anybody what the challenges have been around all of this. Um, if we think back to really the GWAS only world, there have been big challenges uh, in the area of being able to map SNP to gene. And of course, additional challenges, even if we can identify the causal gene in figuring out what the directionality is. I would say in the world uh, that we are currently in, in 2022, um, we are starting to move into an arena where large scale exome sequencing is becoming more and more common. And so of course, this type of data can help us pinpoint the causal gene for a genetic association, but it doesn't always inform us of the absolute directionality. And so uh, I'm showing an example of this below. Uh, this is an association of the gene SRRM2 uh, in the UK Biobank exome sequencing. And this is data from our gene bash portal where you can go in and look at your favorite gene or your favorite phenotype uh, for all of the exome sequencing in UK Biobank. And so for SRRM2, what you can see is that we have a strong missense burden association, but we don't have any kind of PLOF burden association. And so why is that particularly a challenge? We know that when we have a PLOF burden association, what we are effectively saying is that if I have variants in this protein that I am interested in that truncate the protein and are associated with my disease, I can then look at the direction of effect of that PLOF burden test, and right away I'll have some information about the directionality. If those truncating variants 
cause my trade of interest, say that's BMI to go up, then I know that having less of this protein makes BMI go up. So that gives me an idea of therapeutic hypothesis or the way I want to target this protein. If I have a missense burden association and no PLOF association, I can look at the direction of effect on the burden test. And here for SRM2, you can see that it's positive, but that doesn't actually tell you what the missense variants are doing. So we don't know if those missense variants are on the whole increasing or decreasing the activity or the levels of SRRM2. Um, so from that perspective, we don't have an idea of what our therapeutic hypothesis should be. Several years ago, David Altshuler and Robert Plenge proposed something called an allelic series where we would be able to incorporate the missense variant data uh, with functional readout data from each of these variants. And that would give us an idea both of the direction of effect, but could also give us an idea of the horsepower of a particular variant for a particular disease. And so there are examples in the literature uh, where these allelic series have started to be constructed. Um, and one really nice example is from uh, Lucalata and Sudafaruki from several years ago, where they looked at naturally occurring variation in MC4R and correlated those variants' functional activity uh, with their phenotype activity. And for people who uh, for people who do not work in the metabolic space, MC4R is a really nice genetic example. Um, we know that people who have two loss of function mutations in MC4R have early onset, very severe obesity. There is also a non-coding GWAS signal in the locus of MC4R with BMI as well. So for this particular project, Dr. Lada and his colleagues uh, identified all of the MC4R variants in the UK Biobank, uh, and I believe this was based upon the imputed data. So I think this work was done uh, before the exome sequencing uh, efforts were completed. Uh, and what you can see here is they identified several dozen variants in MC4R. So this is actually the MC4R protein in this little snake diagram here. Each one of the dots that is colored in is a variant uh, that they identified in MC4R. And on the right-hand side, you can see the functional characterization as measured by their beta arrest and recruitment. So you can see that several of the variants uh, actually are what we would call gain-of-function variants. They have very high activity, so um, you know almost 300% relative to wild type. And then a good number of these variants are, even though they are missense variants, they are true loss-of-function variants where you should see almost no actual activity in the variants. And Dr. Lada and his colleagues do a lot of work um, comparing the phenotype characteristics of the gain of function variants to the loss of function variants, um, and we're able to show protective effects for the gain of function variants. Uh, but one of the things that we've really been interested in, uh, again, at Pfizer is building that allelic series, and so one of my favorite parts about this publication is they did start to answer that question of whether you can build an allelic series around this data. And that's shown here in the plot on the right. So the X axis here is that functional readout, the beta arresting recruitment, and the Y axis is the BMI association. Each one of these dots, it's a little bit easier to look in on the zoomed in portion of the graph, but if you can see here, each one of these dots is a particular variant in MC4R. And while there's, um, you know, while there is some noise around this data, you can actually model a linear relationship in the direction that we would expect where the loss of function variants are associated with higher BMI, um, but that BMI decreases as you have more beta arrest and activity. And so this is a great example of that allelic series that we would be interested in. So in thinking about this from a drug discovery perspective, what we wanted to know is whether we can apply this type of methodology more broadly to target discovery or target validation. And so at Pfizer, one of the ways that we have started to try to answer this question um, is really to think about how do we get that high throughput um, functional, how do we get that high throughput functional data? We certainly have the genetic data, but what we really need is the functional output. So we are partnering with a company called Domain Therapeutics. Um, and they are able to do an assessment of GPCR signaling across a wide range of signaling effectors. Um, they are able to independently 
evaluate over 25 different pathway uh, event-specific biosensors, and some of these are shown on the right-hand side. And they have profiled over 100 wild-type human GPCRs. So the um, actual assay that Domain Therapeutics uses is something that is a bioluminescence resident energy transfer um, based, so it's a BRET-based molecule. Uh, where the amount of bioluminescence uh, can be correlated with the amount of a signaling activity uh, for each GPCR for each different signaling event. And from this, we can get a number of different key parameters. I'm showing a gene here called ADRB1, where we would be looking at the wild type form of the protein. Um, you can get measures of Emax, of Emin, of EC50, and the signaling area under the curve. Uh, so this platform has a number of advantages. It's cell-based, it's simple, it's very sensitive. Um, and I think the most important thing for our purposes is that it's high throughput. Um, so not only is Domain able to profile 100 wild-type GPCRs, they are also able to, at scale, profile these different GPCRs with different missense or point mutations inserted into them. So we've been applying this methodology across a number of different GPCRs to see if we can um, extend our allelic series uh, or to be able to look at what we're calling human genetic structure activity relationship. So I'm going to talk about a couple of the proof of concepts that we have done so far. The first one we are going to go back to MC4R, um, where we are testing, again, the relationship between the variants in MC4R and BMI using the Domain Therapeutics platform. Uh, so I'm showing you below something that's very similar to the work from Dr. Lada's paper. Uh, again, snake diagram of MC4R. These are the different variants that we have identified in the UK Biobank exome sequencing and profiled with Domain. The activity of these variants is shown here in the bar charts on the left-hand side. So you have a number of variants, uh, wild type activity, uh, with sort of diminishing activity and the number of missense variants that you can see again have very, very low, um, almost no activity at all. Um, and just for representation, these are, this is what the data looks like um, when it comes back from domain. And so you can compare, you can compare different variants. We have some that are very close to wild type. And then again, particular variants where you can, that are showing almost no activity at all. So the next step is to take the pharmacology data that we've generated with domain therapeutics and then um, map that back onto or correlate that with the phenotype data. And this is what we are calling an HGSAR plot, where we can compare this in vitro pharmacology to the human biology uh, or the human genetics data. And so each one of the dots that I'm showing here is a uh, missense mutation um, in MC4R that was identified in the UK Biobank exome sequencing data. We've got about 110 or 115 variants here. The x-axis is that pharmacology value that I just showed you on the previous slide, and the y-axis here um, is the effect of that variant on BMI. BMI here uh, is the residual of the log, which is why you're looking at such a small scale. We then use a method called meta-regression to be able to re regress the um, pharmacology against the BMI to see if there is a linear relationship, and we can test the strength of that relationship, and we do indeed see that there is a very strong p-value here, uh, a decreasing slope, as you would expect, so loss of function in MC4R is associated with higher BMI, um, and we can actually take the slope here and convert it back to a meaningful unit in kilograms. Um, so we've been generating these HGSAR plots for a couple of years now with each subsequent release of new data from the UK Biobank exomes. Um, and this turns out to be kind of an interesting thing where we were a little bit of victims of our own success. So when we first did this with the 200,000 person cohort, the statistical results are not as strong because there's less variance, but it also turns out to be a little bit easier to look at um, just because there's less points on the plot. Um, we're to the point now where people will see these for the first time and say, like, really? That's a p-value that you have here? That the, the data looks really, really messy. Um, and so Eric Alman and Craig Hyde in our group uh, got a 
a really great idea that we should actually try to look at these where we are binning the variance by activity level just to see if that makes the image a little bit clearer. Uh, and that is shown here on the next slide. So just for clarity, we are not doing anything different with the statistical analysis. This is the exact same line you saw on the previous um, on the previous plot, uh, exact same p-value, exact same slope. We are effectively just binning variance um, by groups of, of 20, just basically to be able to represent this a little bit more visually. Um, I, this is one of the most amazing plots. I love looking at these where you can see that actually you have a really nice linear relationship as you go down by increments of 20 with the exception of this oddball here at the bottom, but otherwise it fits this really nice pattern. Um, and so in terms of interpretation, the slope here, um, you can think of this as being the increase in BMI if you go from an activity of 100%, so wild type activity, um, uh, wild type activity all the way to complete loss of function activity at zero. Uh, so that would be your slope. And if we convert this back into units, it works out to be about nine kilograms. Um, these are all subjects who are carrying just one copy of these alleles, or at least those very rare alleles. And so you might think about the pre predicted therapeutic impact for a complete loss of function would be approximately double that amount of nine kilograms. The second question we asked ourselves was one more around the horsepower. Um, and so whether or not could we use something like HGSAR and mimic the impact of a known therapeutic. Uh, GPCRs are a great drug family. There are, um, there are a number of marketed drugs for different diseases. Um, so one of these is the beta adrenergic receptor, which is used to treat blood pressure. Uh, and so we, again, repeated this process. These are all of the variants in the ADRB1 gene. Uh, this is their activity shown on the left-hand side using Domain Therapeutics Platform. Uh, I think what's interesting about ADRB1 that we did not see for MC4R is that we do have about half a dozen of these variants that are actually showing greater than wild type or gain of function activity. And so we then conducted the HGSAR. Uh, we looked at both systolic and diastolic blood pressure, and what I'm showing here are the impact for diastolic blood pressure. And so the HGSAR plot is shown here. Uh, this is directionally what we would expect to see, um, given what we know that um, beta adrogenergic, adrogenergic receptors do. Um, increased activity is associated with increased diastolic blood pressure. Um, and again, we are now looking at, for this particular gene, we are looking at about 200 variants. Um, you know, so there's a, a lot of scatter around the data here. And so again, if we then take this and plot them by bin instead, we can see again, this really nice, extraordinary linear relationship um, where we see an increase in blood pressure uh, as you see an increase in activity. Uh, so in this case, the slope here is interpreted that a subject carrying one inactive allele of ADRB1 is projected to have diastolic blood pressure reduced by approximately 3.4 uh, millimeters of mercury. In this case, we can actually look in the literature and try to get an estimate of what we think the effect of what we think the effect of complete antagonism of this gene is on diastolic blood pressure. Um, and amazingly enough, it turns out to be just about two times what our estimate is for diastolic blood pressure. So at least in this case, um, we can show that this, this HGSAR uh, it works. It's directionally what we would expect. And then actually from a horsepower perspective, it's very similar uh, to actual antagonism of this gene for this particular phenotype. Um, so what I've shown you today are two of our proof of concepts for HGSAR, um, which we have been using both to identify and validate uh, potential targets in our portfolio. Um, and this really does get you at the, um, the, you know, sort of allelic series where we are combining experimental functional data for coding variants with genetic association data. Um, and what I've shown you here uh, are two examples where we have validated targets. Um, I did not show an example of this, 
but we do have data for examples where there was a known genetic association, but where the direction of effect was unclear, and we can use HGSAR uh, and the direction of the slope to be able to determine that. And in the case of ABRB1, um, I've also shown you an example of where we think this can be used to inform horsepower. So for GPCRs, this is something that uh, can be applied at scale using the domain profile. So we are We've been scaling this up to be able to test hundreds of variants across dozens of GPCRs. Um, right now, the ideal phenotype is a quantitative trait. Power is much, much more limited for binary analysis. So I think as our scale of exome sequencing data grows, that will also improve. And finally, we are applying this to GPCRs, but it could of course be extended to any other genes where there is a relevant functional assay um, or some sort of functional output that is quantitative that you could use. And of course, a human relevant phenotype as well. Uh, so with that, I just want to thank everybody involved in this. There have been a number of people at Pfizer who have been um, who have been working on this for the past several years. Uh, and in addition to that, I'd like to thank all of our collaborators at Domain who have uh, done all of the excellent work uh, with the variant profiling and scaling this up so that we can do it in a large scale. Uh, and with that, if there's any time, I'm happy to take a couple of questions. Thanks, uh, Melissa. We are running a little uh, a couple minutes behind, so I'm going to skip to questions. There's a couple of questions in the in the chat, maybe we can return to those after Art. So it's a couple of minutes then. So I'm going to uh, move on to the next talk, which is coming from Art Worcester, who's head of statistical genetics at Biomarin Pharmaceuticals. Uh, he was previously at uh, Genentech before my time, I should say. And he's going to uh, talk to about an example of how they've used uh, high throughput approaches to explore the function of SLC6A1 in relation to neurological disorders. Over to you, Art. Thank you, Mark, for this introduction. I'm Art Wooster. I'm the <clears throat> head of uh, statistical genetics at Biomarin. And this talk is about how we uh, characterized 182 uh, variants in uh, a gene called SLC6A1. This is a, a neuronal GABA transporter, and it's been associated with epilepsy, with autism, schizophrenia. And for most of those variants, before we characterized them, we didn't uh, know uh, whether they were pathogenic or not. So conceptually, this uh, talk, I believe, fits in very nicely with the fantastic talk that we just heard from, from Melissa. And I'm very happy that uh, of the sequencing in this session makes a lot of sense to me. Now, uh, why uh, did we uh, why did we look at this gene? Why did why do we do functional testing at Biomarin? Uh, one big reason is that most genetic tests do not result in a positive molecular diagnosis. Uh, so there's incomplete yield pretty much across the board uh, uh, across different diseases. What you're seeing here is data from uh, Inviter, probably the world's biggest provider of genetic tests. And in the data available uh, for, for, uh, to us, uh, covering about uh, 1.7 million patients, the diagnostic yield overall was around 22%. And uh, when you zoom in and look at uh, specific uh, high-level ICD codes, hypercholesterolemia, cardiomyopathy, epilepsy, the um, diagnostic yield is always between 20 or 30%. Now, focusing in on epilepsy, if you just go for patients that uh, were diagnosed within the first year of life, where you maybe assume that there is a bigger likelihood for there to be a genetic cause, the diagnostic yield goes up to 34%, meaning that two-thirds of patients still don't get a, a genetic diagnosis. Of those two-thirds, um, um, way more than half have uh, at least one variant of unknown significance in a known epilepsy gene. So at least there is some scope for increasing that diagnostic yield that way by just looking at VUSs. Now, um, 
thinking of just uh, in a purely theoretical way about the potential causes for this incomplete diagnostic yield that we are seeing in so many different diseases. There's, of course, the environment, which we can't hope to address uh, using genetics. And then there is noise, whatever that may be. And then there's misgenetics, like polygenic risk or structural variation that we're not particularly good at assaying at the moment, non-coding variation, and then these variants of unknown significance, whether they be in new risk genes or uh, uh, in known risk genes. And for the purposes of this talk, uh, talking about SLC6A1, uh, this is what, what I'll be focusing on, on BUSs in a known risk gene. Now, even for many of these known disease genes, uh, most rare variants are still not uh, functionally uh, characterized. Now, SLC6A1 is a relatively prevalent uh, epilepsy gene. What you see here is a list of the top 10 epilepsy and neurodevelopmental delay genes from a uh, publication uh, from about two years ago now. Uh, SLC6A1 is in the top 10 epilepsy genes with an overall incident, birth incidence of between two and three per 100,000. Uh, and it's, you know, it's, it's a known epilepsy gene. However, um, if you look at the variants that are seen in patients, uh, there are some that are known to be benign in ClinVar or likely benign, and there's some that are likely pathogenic or pathogenic, but then most of them are either not at all classified in ClinVar or they are of uncertain fit significance or they have some conflicting annotations. And that's, the, that's, the, that's the something like 80% of, of all those variants we see in patients. Now, SLC-601 is a great uh, case study for variant characterization. Uh, the way, one way to think about it is to um, align genes on a spectrum where on the one end of the spectrum, you have genes where you don't know what they're doing. And a lot of these ORFs, like uh, I just picked a random example, C3 or 33, uh, we don't ha have any idea what they're doing. And on the other end of the spectrum, we have uh, genes that are pretty well characterized. We know what they're doing. And we also uh, have characterized a lot of the, or maybe even uh, the majority of the variants, the, at least the pathogenic variants in this gene. And NPR2, uh, which is a gene invo uh, involved in, uh, in, in, in growth and uh, in height, is one example of this. SLC61 is, is nice for the purposes of this because it falls in the middle. We know what the gene does. Again, it's a, it's a neuronal GABA transporter, but very few of the variants have been uh, characterized. So a uh, few characterized variants, gene function is known, but uh, we, have, uh, we know what the gene does. So we know what to measure in this case, GABA transport. And uh, the, we can assay this, so we can do a labeled GABA assay to look at individual variants. And there are also clear di disease associations. Uh, the one that has been known the longest for SLC601 is uh, an association with epilepsy um, that's been known for about uh, seven years now. Uh, more recently, a uh, big autism association study uh, has shown that SLC61 is one of the biggest uh, single autism genes when it comes to uh, de novo mutations and uh, variants of mistance variants with high impact. And then there are, um, uh, there's a schizophrenia association as well um, that came out about uh, one and a half years ago. So these are autism and epilepsy often overlap. Schizophrenia is uh, relatively distinct in terms of the patient population. Now we characterized 182 of those variants um, using a, a really scalable and also quite sensitive GABA reuptake assay. The way uh, we went about this was uh, curate the variants, making a list of them uh, from various sources. And the most important ones are listed here. We then uh, cloned SLC61 into a plasmid together with a BLA reporter. 
and then the site-specific mutagenesis to create each of those um, variants. We then transfected the plasmid into uh, HEC293 cells where we had previously uh, deleted SLC601 and then uh, incubated with uh, radio-labeled GABA uh, and then measured uh, the GABA, the radio-labeled GABA uh, using uh, mass spec, using the BLASA for um, normalization. And so this was, this turned out to be scalable. So we were able to do um, this, uh, this large number of variants. And another nice feature of this assay is that it allows absolute uh, quantification of uh, GABA transport. Now, uh, moving on to the results we got out of this. Um, if we uh, so in, you're going to see a bunch of those graphs. Um, the x-axis is always uh, GABA transport as a, pro a proportion of the wild type. And so here are the variants um, split by um, variant function. And this behaves very much as we would have expected before we ran the assay. So you get your synonymous variants. We included a handful as, as negative controls, and you get truncating variants, infram indel, frame shift, and stop gained on the other end of the spectrum, all of them with very low function below 10% or so of, of wild type. And then you get the missense variants in orange in between. And as you would expect, they have the whole spectrum from complete loss of function to maybe mild gain of function, but at least uh, wild type. Now, if we uh, cut this by Clinvar classification, again, this looks uh, like expected. So we included some benign variants. Uh, they are around 100% of wild type function. The pathogenic variants on the other end, uh, they are almost all um, loss of function below 40% or so with the unclassified variants in between. If we look at NOMAD allele count, uh, again, this looks like uh, we would have expected with um, the uh, with variants that are relatively common, with five uh, or, or more uh, um, alleles seen in Nomad, uh, being having higher function than those that are that are singletons in Nomad, or not at all seen in Nomad. Now. Uh, because we have included these uh, negative controls, this allows us to um, have a threshold, to define a threshold distinguishing uh, variants that reduce function and are by extension more likely to, pathogen to be pathogenic from those that uh, do not reduce function. Uh, we uh, picked a threshold of 42.8%. Um, it is possible to endlessly argue whether that is the right threshold. Our results are um, stable to altering that. And uh, maybe that would be uh, one, one question we can return to if there's time for questions at the end. Now, um, we started off, as I said, with 182 variants, um, most of them unclassified. Um, and uh, our results align pretty well with uh, the, with prior knowledge, if that was available, whether the variant was pathogenic or benign. Uh, we ended up uh, after our assay with 102 variants that uh, have low function and only 25 out of those 102 were previously known to be pathogenic. Now this uh, very strongly implies an increased diagnostic yield so definitely we have increased the number of variants that we would uh, consider likely pathogenic uh, based on, 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 on this. Um, so uh, we, we see a, if we just uh, focus on variants that have been classified in ClinVar, this uh, means a 92% increase in pathogenic variants. If I then ask what that means in terms of the number of patients, that get, would get a positive uh, genetic, di well, a genetic diagnosis, this increases uh, that number by 40%. So um, um, a 40% increase in uh, patients with a, uh, with a possible pathogenic variant. Uh, 
Uh, we did uh, some additional follow-up analysis. What we did here, for example, was map the variance to uh, the protein structure. Uh, what you can see is that variants that are in the transmembrane region of the, um, of the protein are more likely to be uh, uh, to have reduced function. When you look at the 3D structure, and unfortunately this doesn't come out very nicely in a static image, but what uh, I hope you will trust me when I say that um, a, a lot of the variants that uh, strongly reduce function are lining the pore in the center of the protein through which uh, GABA must, must pass. And this uh, strongly suggests a potential mechanism of pathogenesis for those variants. Um, now, uh, uh, I mentioned earlier that SLC601 is also associated with schizophrenia. And what we see uh, is some indication that the mechanism of pathogenesis for SLC601 schizophrenia is slightly different from the mechanism of SLC601 epilepsy or autism. In, uh, so in this figure, um, you see at the bottom your uh, variants that we see in epilepsy patients with many of those being uh, loss of function. But then you also in blue see variants that are definitely associated with schizophrenia and that are seen in schizophrenia patients, but that association is not as clear. And not many of those fall bit below that threshold of 42.8%. So this suggests that either schizophrenia is caused by hypomorphic, but not loss of function variants, or maybe even an alternative mechanism of pathogenesis. Um, this aligns very nicely with the uh, different patient characteristics we see between epilepsy and schizophrenia. Um, we just typically know that there are no seizures seen in the in, in, in SLC6A1 schizophrenia patients, and of course, the age of onset is later as well. Also, this does not support inhibition of SLC6A1 for schizophrenia. Uh, there is currently a trial out there uh, on cl uh, clinicaltrials.gov, uh, uh, SLC6A1 inhibitor, Tiagabine, scheduled to read out later this year. Based on these results, I'm not optimistic that this is going to be a, a successful clinical trial. Now, I'm already a little bit over time, so I'm going to skip the summary and just quickly focus on the potential caveats because uh, those are going to need lead nicely over to, to questions if there's time for that. So uh, one potential caveat is that we, uh, our uh, system is HEC293 cells, not GABAergic neurons, where SLC601 is physiologically expressed. And also we assume that low GABA transport function predicts pathogenicity. And um, I think that's a very reasonable assumption, but it, uh, you know, we can argue with that. A lot of people have contributed uh, to this, but I would particularly uh, like to highlight Marina Trinidad, a senior research associate at uh, Biomarin, uh, who uh, designed the assay and coordinated with a CRO uh, that, uh, that ran the, the assays Alliance Pharma. Thank you. Uh, thanks, Sart. Um, um... I'm afraid we are a bit, bit adjacent on time, so I don't think we may have time for any, any follow-up questions, but I'm sure you'll be accessible to people who want to reach you uh, through other means. I did want to take the opportunity to thank our three speakers who've given a really good flavor of some of the approaches that pharma is using, and, and academics, of course, as well, to, to address this question of function at scale. So uh, thanks to them for covering the, the ground so fantastically. And with that, I will hand back to Cecilia and Mark who will take us to the close.